You are listening to Are You Ready Radio with Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. Find Are You Ready on Facebook and Instagram at Are You Ready Radio. You can also visit our home on the web. Just go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the program's link. If you missed the live show, you can listen to the show's archives on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, and many more, including our home on Spreaker. When a disaster happens, are you ready? Do you have the supplies you need to keep you and your family safe and survive? The Zombie Outpost Store in Wilmington, Ohio at Caesar Creek Flea Market stocks quality gear you need to be ready for the next emergency or even a camping trip. Visit ZombieOutpostStore.com for location and hours. Check out our assortment of essentials you need when the next disaster happens. Go to ZombieOutpostStore.com. Get 10% off a checkout when you mention Are You Ready Radio. Be ready and be prepared. In this digital society, making connections is quickly becoming a lost art form. Yet, if you are a small business owner, building your network is the only way you can get ahead. Can these skills be learned? You bet they can. Read Nose to Nose Networking, no-nonsense in-person networking tips from a master. Who's the master? Well, who better to teach networking and friend building skills than a golden retriever? The author, Melanie Hope, takes the antics of Abigail and translates them into the human experience. Through Abby, you will learn how to set your intention, build a network, and get into and out of conversations with Grace. If you love the Dog Abby segments on Counterculture Wise Radio, you will love Nose to Nose Networking even more. Find it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hard copy, Kindle, and Nook. Visit CounterCultureWise.com for direct links. Greetings and salutations, CounterCultureWise listeners. This is Maximilian von Riegelbeiser inviting you and yours to listen to me and mine. Join me, my sisters Abby and Fritzy, and my weekly guests, my father Jim and Mumsy Melanie, for CounterCultureWise. Max, it's not your show. And we're not your guests, Max. We're the hosts. You may want to rein it in a little bit, buddy. Very well. Tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific at CounterCultureWise.com for our amazing live variety show. You can even chat with us. If you ask me, though, it should be called Counterculture Max. Counterculture Wise. Radio with heart in mind. Got a spare tire around that waist? Is your muffin top over the top? Do you binge eat uncontrollably? We are the government and we are here to help you. Here at our free FEMA weight loss camp, we have numerous ways to help you shed those unsightly unwanted pounds. FEMA, or Fatties, eating mitigated, automatically has a communist-style weight loss czar that specializes in centralized weight loss planning and communal extended fasting programs to shed that fat away in no time. Skin and boned means extra tone is the motto. Just remember, there is no way you can do it on your own. We will forcefully assist you into compliance. Failure is not an option in this utopian wonderland. How fantastic. Typical workout regimes include digging ditches and restocking them with dirt. Building railways and more. Get life skills while you get lean. How do you join? Simple. Recite the Constitution in a public commons or violate the Patriot Act that includes simple misdemeanors. It's really that easy to get your own fenced-in slice of Americana. Stop being a fatty. The state is your daddy. If you like what you are listening to, we appreciate your support. A small contribution from you, the listeners, can continue to help bring you such content and help keep things going here. Even if it's just a dollar a month. 
Keep in mind, though, in the spirit of prepping, we believe in redundancy, so it's better to have more than one, but every little bit helps pay the bills. Go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the Support the Show link. You can make a one-time or monthly contribution in any dollar amount. And again, thank you for your support and listening. Are You Ready is an NP Media Group production and is the official broadcast of the Zombie Outpost in Wilmington, Ohio. The views and opinions expressed during this broadcast are those of the host and not that of the station, advertisers, or its affiliates. You are listening to Are You Ready Radio with Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. You never know when an emergency is going to happen. Disaster can strike at any time. Whether stuck on the road, riding out a power outage, escaping a natural disaster, or surviving a doomsday apocalypse, what would you do? No matter the scale, whether one hour or one year, will you survive? You're about to hear what it takes to be prepared. Now ask yourself, are you ready? Have you ever heard the term prepper? What comes to mind? Some of you may think it's a crazy guy with a bomb shelter and an old army truck parked on the front lawn. Well, Prepper simply is a person who is ready for almost any emergency, small or large. It's no different than on a rainy day taking an umbrella with you when you leave your home or putting a coat on when it's cold outside. So maybe you think you're prepared for a brief time in that environment. But what if a few minutes turn into a day or even a year? I'm your host, Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper, and I'm going to use my over 25 years of prepping and survival experience and knowledge in this program to help you and your family prepare to handle almost anything from a small event, from a doomsday apocalypse. So get ready, because I'm prepared to enlighten you to seriously think, prepare, and answer the question, are you ready? And I want to hear anything you have to say about the subject, whatever you may have to offer. You see... It's important that we share our knowledge with each other, learn from each other, and help each other out. You see, the more prepared those around us are, the better your chances of survival will be when a disaster happens. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard the term zombies. Well, those are just those that are not prepared and come after whatever you have. Well, the call-in number is... 513-815-6336 if you want to be a part of the show. Again, that's 513-815-6336. Also, check out our live chat room on Spreaker. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, Spreaker.com. Just go to the Are You Ready show, search it right there in the search bar. You can get there live through the website, nickpiercemedia.com. I post exclusive content on the home of Are You Ready on Facebook and on Instagram. Just go to Are You Ready Radio. You can interact with other members of the prepping community before, during, and after our broadcast. So share your knowledge. And again, if you want to call, the call-in number is 513-815-6336. So in this episode, I'm changing it up a little bit. I am actually going to answer your uh, questions that you've sent in and uh, things that people have asked me. And one in particular, uh, there's been a lot about these active mass shooters, uh, mass uh, shooting situations lately, um, ever since the incident in Buffalo, of course, and there have been others throughout the country. Um, I was looking at statistics. There was actually so far a year to date over 200 um, active shooter situations in public places uh, this year alone, 2022. So it was kind of odd. And I've discussed this before on previous broadcasts uh, when it comes to um, different things to be prepared for and what to do in a situation like that. And I'm going to cover that um, as one of the questions. I don't want to focus one episode strictly on that, though, because uh, this this episode is about answering your questions, mostly. And uh, I'm going to cover things such as, uh, you know, important barter items. Uh, That was one question someone asked me. Uh, are you still going barefoot when the fit hits the shan? What books and videos do I recommend? Uh, what else? Uh, what's the most important piece of gear that I have? Um, what style of martial arts do I prefer? Uh, trapping, fishing, hunting, stuff like that. Of course, I have our prepper kitchen tip of the week, some prepping for pets, financial segment, and all that as well that we'll throw into the mix. And uh, also, oh, even my mistakes that I have made when I was starting out. So that should all be uh, quite exciting, Um, and I'm sure you probably would love to know (laughs) um, what mistakes I've made. And, you know, probably everybody has made mistakes at some point when it comes to prepping. And I wouldn't necessarily say not just mistakes, 
but maybe just a little bit of, um, in hindsight, I wish I knew that then, I guess we could say. Or, um, you know, and I'll cover some of the uh, uh, oops and slip-ups and stuff like that that I've had when it comes to um, my early years. And even uh, probably some stuff that I probably still uh, uh, made a mistake today on. So uh, not everybody hits the mark 100% of the time. But, um, of course, the more you get out there and the more you do stuff, the more familiar you are with stuff. And, well, hey. Um and even then, I've also been guilty of some of my own mistakes on very small-scale stuff, of course. So, um, yeah, all that in this episode of Are You Ready? And I want to get started. Now, um, I'm going to get this all out of the way right now as far as the active shooter, mass shooter um, situation and what to do. Now, um, you, you can go to 100 different websites. Everybody's got ideas. And on the original platform for Are You Ready? Actually, it's just on our YouTube channel, I think. It's still on the YouTube channel. Um, whether it was from the legacy platform or not, uh, it's still Are You Ready? Uh, you can uh, go to the page here or you know, on any one of our things and uh, see our, our YouTube link to find Are You Ready Radio. Um, I think it's Are You Ready Official. I'd have to look that up. Uh, but if you go to if you go to zombieoutpoststore.com, go to the program, um, the podcast link, and you go to... Um, You'll see the social media links for the radio show. That's probably the easiest way to find it. Zombieoutpoststore.com and click on the podcast and follow the links to YouTube there. And you'll see a demo that I did for an active shooter situation if you're in public and you don't have cover concealment or um, an exit way. Uh, So that's a very handy video to watch with some interesting tips um, to keep you as safe as possible. And hopefully that saves your life one day. But I will go through uh, on this program just a little bit about active shooters, um, the situations that occur. Um, they, they they happen very unexpectedly. Um, you know, it's not just about an active shooter, but types of mass attacks, really. Um, well, most of what you'll hear is individuals using firearms that cause mass casualties, which they consider an active shooter. Well, in these other types of mass attacks, there's also individual, yeah, individuals using vehicles to cause mass casualties. We've seen that. Um, Individuals using homemade bombs to cause mass casualties. And other methods used in mass attacks um, could be just someone using a knife, fires, drones, or other weapons. So um, think about all that. When we talk about the mass shooter situation, it's actually an an active um, mass attack, types of mass attacks. Uh, But for the most part, um, you'll find a lot of website, uh, a lot of information on different websites, but overall, um, a couple steps you want to take uh, to start off. And some of these uh, steps may seem like common sense, others you may not have thought of. And the um, first thing really um, is, is avoiding it or knowing it's about to happen, being observant, uh, staying alert. You want to always be aware of your environment and any dangers in your environment not just for active shooters but anything that could happen um anything from a structure collapse to um you know someone run you over crossing the street you know um you always want to be aware of your surroundings so stay alert when it comes to anything suspicious though um, you want to notify your local authorities if you see anything that's like a suspicious package, people behaving suspiciously or strangely, uh, someone using strange communication devices that you may not be familiar with. So it's it goes along that if you see something, say something, saying that if you've ever been to some major cities riding uh, mass transit systems, uh, you'll constantly hear this alert. I remember when, you know before I moved away from New York, it was constantly in every mass transit systems. If you see something, say something. Remember the Port Authority, and you know, it was, you know if you see something, say something. Uh, it's important, you know. Even if even if it may turn out to be nothing, at least it can be looked into. And sometimes just the thought that someone's watching will make it a harder target to hit if people are aware of what's going on. And of course, before anything, there's also warning signs. Usually. Um, you know, and this this always seems to be what what comes out afterwards. You know, they always say like, we don't know how this slipped through our radar. You know, local authorities have had encounters with this person before, or oh yeah, the FBI's been watching them. The Department of Homeland Security was you know supposedly on top of it, but they miss warning signs, violent communications, um, sometimes even uh, substance abuse, 
uh, could, you know, and, and just their behavior being affiliated with, we'll say, radical organizations that have racist tendencies, such as um, or racist propaganda, such as um, the incident in Boston from what we're discovering as the investigations unfolding. Um, sometimes they, uh, you know, they have maybe anger issues or intent to cause harm. These warning signs end up increasing over time and you, you don't want to overlook them. So it you know, observe the warning signs. Don't dismiss them. Uh, keep an eye on them, even if it's something you may not be able to act on right away. Now, the next step in avoiding uh, a situation um, for mass attack is having an exit plan. When anytime you're out in public somewhere, you always want to have an exit plan. When you go to the movie theater, you see the exit signs. When you board an airplane, they tell you, "Hey, this is how to get off the airplane." Um, you know, you shouldn't have to be told to look for the nearest exit. You should always scan around, look for exits in any building, any facility, any restaurant, anything, any business that you're in. Uh, be mindful of those. So as you're going up and down aisles shopping, know where, you obviously know where the main exit is, but there's other exits throughout the store, maybe through back rooms, um, different offices, and they may not always be clearly marked, but at least um, you'll have an idea of where to go because anytime you go into a room or we'll say a warehouse or, you know, the back room of a store, stock room, uh, you know, the, the, behind the meat counter in the, in the, in the butcher, you know, area, in, in the produce area, you know, there's always a way out. You don't just uh, come in and out through, we'll say, the refrigerator door where the milk is. Not only do you have the entrance in there, but there's also most likely other exits. So keep that in mind. Always have an exit plan. Um, and then, of course, learn life-saving skills if you ever do need them. So things like first aid, CPR, even if it's just basic first aid, um, all those can be very helpful um, in the aftermath of an event to be able to help uh, folks before help arrives. So that's pretty much the... Um, what to do before preparing before and uh you know as far as in any situation that you're in now during the event during an active um you know uh, shooter or mass attack situation we'll say um you know it, it, it it's always going to play out differently you can't say what the best option is out of all the things that you could possibly do you want to obviously you know People may want to play hero and and all that, but you're no good if you're not safe. So you're not going to be effective if you just sit there Wild West style and just start shooting back. Um, also keep in mind, you want to make sure that the actual person who is a threat and not others that may be defending themselves are also... You, you want to be positive before you, before you start firing off if you, if you carry a firearm. Okay, seek safety, you know, assess the situation, make sure you can possibly identify the threat, and um, seek safety. Get away from the attacker, um, you know, is, is number one priority. Don't worry about gathering things up. Like, don't worry about, oh, your purse is on the chair, and you, you know, or, you know, it, you know, you left your coat on the rack by the front door. Just get to safety. Run to safety. Leave your belongings behind. And call 911 as soon as you can. You know, the more backup you get there, the better. Um, now, obviously, you can't just run away. If you can't run away from the whole event, maybe it, maybe you're in the, you know, a small restaurant. You're just sitting there in the middle. Uh, you want to seek cover. Cover and hide. And there's a difference between hiding and cover. Okay? Concealment versus cover. Now, if anybody's taken a, a firearms class or any kind of training in that matter, um, they'll always discuss the difference between cover and concealment. Concealment doesn't offer protection, we'll say. It just keeps you from being seen, noticed, or visible. Cover means that you're behind something solid enough that a bullet is not going to penetrate, that a vehicle is not going to run through. Uh, maybe if you're on the other side of a building, and, and we'll say a vehicle being used to mow down mass amounts of people, you're around the corner. Maybe they're not going to be able to run the, the, a, tr a truck or a car through an entire building just to get to you. That would be considered cover. It's also concealment. Cover, 
will also hide you, but cover is more effective at keeping the threat from harming you, whatever it is. So you can cover and hide if you can't evacuate. You should only stick around at cover and work, work on hiding if you can't evacuate. Uh, the, the mass attacks are made to take out people, and they're random. You, you don't know who the targets are in that particular attack. It could be everybody. In the case of the Boston shooting, uh, like I said, Boston Buffalo uh, shooting recently, uh, that was an uh, attack on, against the African-American community uh, that was racistly driven from what the investigation showing so far. Don't figure out if you're okay and you're not. You just take cover if you can't evacuate. And then, then if you can hide out of view of the attacker or put a solid barrier between uh, yourself and the, and the threat if possible, that's great. Uh, it, then you're not a target. They're looking for people. Now, if you're in, we'll say, rooms where uh, there's a, um, you know, you, you, know, you have a door, an option to lock the door, like class, like a school, uh, office buildings, anything like that, lock, close and lock the door, close the blinds and turn off the lights. This way, you're, you're not notice, you're less noticeable, and stay quiet. Don't don't let anybody know you're in there. Until of course the situation's over, law enforcement rescue arrives, whatever the however the situation plays out. Then of course, hey, I'm in here. Um, you know, identify where you are, and and I'll I'll get to when help arrives because I was going to say when they do arrive, I'll, but I'll get into that in a second. Uh, I don't want to get too off track because if you can't run to safety, you can't cover and hide. Your last resort is fight. Fight only as a last resort. When you can't run for cover, when you can't escape the situation and run to safety, you want to attempt to disrupt the attack, um, you know, or disable the attacker if you can. Be aggressive, and once you commit to it, you go through with it. There's no hesitation. If you can recruit others to help you, back you up, ambush the attacker, whatever it is, use makeshift weapons, chairs, fire extinguishers, scissors, book, anything you can. Um, I do a I do a video on the YouTube channel where I talk about alternate uh, self defense devices, self defense weapons, where I use everyday objects and explain certain things about them that can be used as in self defense or even in this situation to attack and you know disrupt the the actions of someone causing a mass attack. And you want to be prepared once you commit to cause severe or lethal injury to the attacker. Now's not the time to be nice. Once you make that commitment, you will do everything you can. You have to do everything you can to stop it, or you are the closest. You are the next one that's going to die. Think of it that way. It's your life or theirs. And once you make the decision to disable them, stop them, disrupt them, or whatever, you have to go all the way. And, of course, after that, then help any wounded. Now... Uh, that brings me to when it comes to like you know when law enforcement shows up and all that um it, you want to be safe afterwards as well okay now you may of course you, maybe you have a concealed carry maybe you, maybe you open carry maybe you don't have a permit it depends on where, where in the country you live sometimes you don't have to, you're not required to have a, uh, a firearms license and if you um it, when law enforcement shows up you don't want them to mistake you for the threat so remain calm, follow any instructions, keep your hands visible and empty. Even if you have a pair of scissors in your hand that you were going to use to, you know, take down the attacker, when, when they show up and they're giving orders and they're giving commands and they're giving instruction, follow them. And as long as your life is not in danger by the attacker still, keep your hands empty and visible. Okay? Um, report to any areas that you need to report to to provide information. A lot of times they'll set up um, areas where they'll have uh, detectives and, and uh, agents, uh, law enforcement, just wherever they tell you to go to provide whatever information they want or get help, go to that area. Follow any instructions that law enforcement gives you in either evacuating, if, they're, if they don't <laughs> evacuate, um, go in the opposite direction they're coming from because they had to come in from somewhere if you're not familiar with where you are. Uh, sometimes you may be in an office building or a, a, a facility that you've never been in before. You're not familiar with it. Um, the direction that they're coming from is where the direction is you can get out. Um, but listen to any information about the situation that they share with you. Um, 
share any updates, um, you know, as well with any family and friends when you're when you're able to. If, especially if they think that you've been there, they, they know that you're in that area or whatever, make sure they know you're okay. Um, you don't want to have them come down or, you know, you don't want people coming to the scene to check on you, you know, just, you know, just let them know you're okay and you'll get home. That's really the gist of a mass attack situation and what to do for that. Now, of course, we are running out of time. That music means we're coming up to our first break. Um, we're going to take it now real quick, and I will be right back. I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. You are listening to Are You Ready? I'm answering more of your questions in this episode coming up um, after we get back. Stick around. Find Are You Ready on Facebook and Instagram at Are You Ready Radio. You can also visit our home on the web. Just go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the program's link. If you missed the live show, you can listen to the show's archives on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, and many more, including our home on Spreaker. When a disaster happens, are you ready? Do you have the supplies you need to keep you and your family safe and survive? The Zombie Outpost Store in Wilmington, Ohio at Caesar Creek Flea Market stocks quality gear you need to be ready for the next emergency or even a camping trip. Visit ZombieOutpostStore.com for location and hours. Check out our assortment of essentials you need when the next disaster happens. Go to ZombieOutpostStore.com. Get 10% off a checkout when you mention Are You Ready Radio. Be ready and be prepared. In this digital society, making connections is quickly becoming a lost art form. Yet, if you are a small business owner, building your network is the only way you can get ahead. Can these skills be learned? You bet they can. Read Nose to Nose Networking, no-nonsense in-person networking tips from a master. Who's the master? Well, who better to teach networking and friend building skills than a golden retriever? The author, Melanie Hope, takes the antics of Abigail and translates them into the human experience. Through Abby, you will learn how to set your intention, build a network, and get into and out of conversations with Grace. If you love the Dog Abby segments on Counterculture Wise Radio, you will love Nose to Nose Networking even more. Find it on Amazon and Barnes & Noble in hard copy, Kindle, and Nook. Visit CounterCultureWise.com for direct links. Greetings and salutations, CounterCultureWise listeners. This is Maximilian von Riegelbeezer inviting you and yours to listen to me and mine. Join me, my sisters Abby and Fritzy, and my weekly guests, my father Jim and Mumsy Melanie, for Counterculture Wise. Max, it's not your show. And we're not your guests, Max. We're the hosts. You may want to rein it in a little bit, buddy. Very well. Tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific at CounterCultureWise.com for our amazing live variety show. You can even chat with us. If you ask me, though, it should be called Counterculture Max. Counterculture Culture Wise! Radio with heart in mind. Got a spare tire around that waist? Is your muffin top over the top? Do you binge eat uncontrollably? We are the government and we are here to help you. Here at our free FEMA weight loss camp, we have numerous ways to help you shed those unsightly, unwanted pounds. FEMA, or Fatties, eating mitigated, automatically has a communist-style weight loss czar that specializes in centralized weight loss planning and communal extended fasting programs to shed that fat away in no time. Skin and boned means extra tone is the motto. Just remember, there is no way you can do it on your own. We will forcefully assist you into compliance. Failure is not an option in this utopian wonderland. How fantastic. 
Typical workout regimes include digging ditches and restocking them with dirt, building railways and more. Get life skills while you get lean. How do you join? Simple. Recite the Constitution in a public commons or violate the Patriot Act that includes simple misdemeanors. It's really that easy to get your own fenced-in slice of Americana. Stop being a fatty. The state is your daddy. If you like what you are listening to, we appreciate your support. A small contribution from you, the listeners, can continue to help bring you such content and help keep things going here, even if it's just a dollar a month. Keep in mind, though, in the spirit of prepping, we believe in redundancy, so it's better to have more than one, but every little bit helps pay the bills. Go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the Support the Show link. You can make a one-time or monthly contribution in any dollar amount. And again, thank you for your support and listening. You are listening to Are You Ready Radio with Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. And welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Are You Ready Radio. I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. Thanks for tuning in or staying with us if you've been tuned in. This week on the program, I am answering questions. So um, this is pretty much uh, before the break. I went through uh, active mass shooters or uh, mass attacks and how to prepare for that. And moving on, uh, we're not going to make this episode about any one particular topic. We're going to do this from time to time with some of the popular questions that folks ask me, and I catch up on them when I have enough for a broadcast, and then um, do a special show dedicated strictly to that. And uh, moving on to some of the other questions here. Uh, this broadcast I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, things from uh, important barter items, which is coming up now, uh, mistakes that maybe I made, uh, all different things that folks have asked. And feel free to chime in in the chat room, too. Just go to Spreaker.com, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com, and search Are You Ready? You can go to our live chat room during the program right now if you're listening live Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, which actually, I guess, right now we are pretty much to 7.30, but, um, or thereabout, the bottom of the hour. Moving on. So, uh, here we go. Uh, what are the most important barter items to stock up on? Now, again, I'm answering these all my, uh, from my point of view and all that, uh, and uh, based on my experience, research, and everything, and uh, just some of my theories and ideas. Uh, bartering may be a very important uh, component of a post-fit-hits-the-shan situation or event um, when paper money has no value. You, maybe you can't access an ATM or the bank. I know the banks were closed even during COVID. The ATMs weren't being restocked. There was, uh, there was quite a few uh, issues, especially around where I am. And uh, maybe if your debit or credit card doesn't work anymore, or maybe that system's down at the merchants that you're shopping at. Um, so that, that's the reason why maybe uh, you're going to resort, resort to bartering. Uh, some folks had stuff that um, so other folks didn't, uh, especially during the pandemic. And uh, bartering uh, really helped people get certain things that they need that either weren't available because of shortages and limitations. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes someone had something that's just as valuable to them that they didn't have. So uh, to do a trade or barter uh, has been done. Uh, it's it, barter's been used a lot in the past, and you know the other school thought is not not just maybe if paper money's no good, uh, but just because the government says a dollar bill is worth a dollar, really who says it really is, and what's a dollar anymore? Uh, so most importantly, what happens to that dollar when the government is gone? Now most folks are in the US, we, we're not too worried about that. But an item is only as valuable as the material it's made from, or uh, the use you can get out of it anyway. Uh, so, um, you know, now the dollar even can't be used to get what you used to use it to get, because you can't get much from it due to the rising cost uh, and inflation. And most of us may still be making the same, if not less, than we were before the value of the dollar decreased, not just here in the U.S. alone. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, 
uh, bartering uh, will have uh, will, will will be very useful, and having items to barter with uh, that maybe you may not need or maybe you have an excess of is great. And you always see a lot of and this is, again these this is my opinion. You always see um, websites and articles and, and posts and and all kinds of stuff in research that says here's the stuff you want to stockpile to barter. Well, anything you want to have items that are valuable to others in order to, to to get items that you may need, maybe that your family will need. There's stuff that you would normally buy if you don't have them. So the list of items to stock up on to barter with can go on forever. I mean, what's valuable? You know, you're the saying one man's trash is another man's treasure. So I'm going to share the items that I would not have to barter. Um, I, I wouldn't really bother having uh, to try to barter with them, I guess we could say. So this is what I would not have. And of course, people are going to disagree with this, but everybody has their own plan and their own reasons. And you're asking me these questions; these are my answers. So, and I'd like to hear, um, you know, point, counterpoint, pros, cons, right, wrong. Um, I want to hear your opinions and where you stand on it. So, uh, of course, you know, chime in in the chat room if you'd like. Uh, coins. Coins are not much better than paper currency, and you always hear, you know, you see people say, "Oh, have uh, have coins, keep keep coins around." You know, coins are just like paper money. Very few people will be able to turn them into usable materials, and most people won't want to waste the resources needed to process them anyway. So, yeah, okay, you have a bunch of copper pennies. Well, how much copper is really in a penny? You know, if you need copper, how are you going to process that to make copper, to make wire, to make anything? Um... You, you know, and I, I get arguments on this point, but the same goes for gold and other precious metals. Okay? You always hear people say, yeah, dollar's not going to be worth anything, but gold will always be valuable. Silver will always be valuable. Gold and silver and precious metals and gems and all this. Well, to me, they're also worthless. You can't eat them, you can't build with them, you can't use them as tools. Precious metals and gems are mostly ornamental items with no intrinsic value. Especially to nomadic people or survivalists, for that matter. Okay? Because um, if you want to stockpile gold and silver chains, you know, in the hopes that um, maybe each little link might be worth something when the fit hits the shan, go ahead. Uh, I'd be filling my 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 stockpile um you know with universally useful things that people actually need to survive and not so much charms and ornaments gems stuff like that because y you can't eat them i mean uh, what are you going to do and who who's going to rather say, sure, I'll take your gold for, you know, this roll of toilet paper, okay? So, it, that and it just weighs a lot of gold. So, um, now, another thing that's not on my list, weapons and ammunition. Those are not on my stockpile for barter list. I mean, would you rather be well-armed or be the one responsible for arming some crazy guy? And, you know, I wouldn't. I'd rather have the bigger, better, nastier weapons than anyone else in the post-apocalyptic world. I'm not about to barter away my weapons or ammo. So that's my answer to that. Now, go ahead and read the lists of everything that you should stockpile to barter with. Uh, you're going to find a lot of ideas on everything from toilet paper to cookies. And um, you stockpile things that you know that you're not only going to use, things that you'll need... Um, and if you have an excess of it, then maybe that's your barter pot. Now, I always come into some miscellaneous random things, um, like three cans of carrots. I'm never going to use them. I, I'm not going to. That'll go in the barter food pile. And uh, I, I don't even know why I have them. I don't know. Let's see. What other questions do we have here? Uh, let's see. I'm going to go to that one probably later on. Or better yet, why don't I do it now? 
mistakes um, that you've made or wish you knew back when. And again, I'd have to say not mistakes, but looking back, I wish I knew that when I started prepping. I think it's better than maybe just mistakes. But hey, why not? We'll make this segment here our prepping mistake of the week. So the question as it was asked to me was, what mistakes have you made when you were starting to prep? Um, and that was also um, another part of the question was, is there anything uh, looking back that you know now that you wish you knew then? So it's kind of all lumped into one thing. And I figured, well, I did some thinking about that. And I thought about it. Now, as far as, um, I guess, mistakes... When I, when I was thinking about it, I'd have to say maybe building my preps based on panic and not doing enough research before buying. Uh, that was, I think, one of my big ones when I look back at it. Because I, you know, I figured I really need to get my stuff together. You know, there was a point many, many years ago where I said, okay, I, um, I, I know what I had when I was in the Boy Scouts. I don't have some of that anymore. So let me... Uh, you know, go out and get all that stuff again. And then, uh, I mean, minus the uniform and all that, of course. And, uh, but mostly the gear that I probably didn't have in the backpack. I wanted one just like the one I had in Scouts and, and all that. And, and, uh, I was ready. I thought I was. I really did. I thought I was ready. And I thought about how practical some of this was. Did some research on some scenarios. You know, the internet really wasn't around the way it was now. So it's kind of you got to do a lot of researching and you got to really talk to people and you got to find the right people to talk to and you got to hope that the people once you find them are willing to talk to you. So let's face it, I mean, there was no Facebook groups, there was no Facebook. Uh, MySpace was probably just coming out? No, it was even way before MySpace. I remember MySpace. That came out years later. Um, the Internet was still in its early, early years. So not a whole wealth of information. If it was there, it was hard to find. Search engines really didn't work the way they did, so you really had to spend a lot of time someplace that had a good computer that was connected to the Internet to really find a lot of the information. So, um, I eventually figured, you know, well, I should take all this gear, go out and create scenarios that I was thinking would happen and see if I have the right gear. And it really turns out it's like, eh, when I look at other stuff on the market, there's better stuff since, things have evolved and developed. Um, some stuff it was I really don't need and I had it now so over the course of a few years there was a lot of trial and error so I would have to say that my stake would be building up my uh, my gear my, my, my supplies and uh, not doing enough research before buying because I ended up having to spend more money then and then the backpack was just not right for what I wanted and it was just <clears throat> anyway uh, another thing when I was thinking about it is not talking about it for years, which in turn limited my network. Now, that kind of is what maybe took me so long or maybe I wasn't talking to the right people or not. Maybe I was and just not talking about what I was planning or going to do and what I wanted to do when it came to prepping. So maybe that's what led me to buying some of the stuff that I thought I really needed and I really didn't and then needing to get other stuff and because I, I wasn't talking to the right people and again, it wasn't like there's like some online forum uh, group, page, um, some social media, anything back then. So, uh, 
you really don't know who the like-minded people are because at the same time, a lot of them aren't talking about what they're really doing when it comes to this. So it was kind of hard. And that also really limited my network at the very beginning because I couldn't know or do everything. So it was important to have a network of people that were good at certain things that you were not. Um, especially back way back in the days when it came to firearms and all that. I mean, I had a rifle, BB gun, you know, I played the rifle in Boy Scouts, and that was about it. I uh, grew up in Jersey, you don't, you know, especially 20 minutes right outside of Manhattan and going back and forth to New York City, you don't have that, you don't have access to that, you don't, you can't have that. So it wasn't until I moved out to Ohio when I was able to really expand my network uh, when it came to folks with firearms and stuff, and then, uh, you know, eventually I'm pretty proficient now. I, you know, I'm probably nowhere near as good as some folks, but uh, I know some people that can build their own guns. I, I'm not there. But uh, I expanded my network eventually, which helped me um, in being more successful prepping, uh, not just when it comes to gear, but what to get, what to stockpile, what to use, and certain... Um, the certain way of doing it, the right way. And that's what I'm always talking to you about, is helping you do it the right way and avoiding the mistakes that I've made in the past and teaching you what I've learned. Um, kind of where it goes along with, like, survival meals, you know? I'm like, I'm going to be a prepper. I'm going to make sure I'm ready. And I wanted all this MRE freeze-dried food stuff, and I'm like, yeah, now I'm set because I had 12 of those meals. Mm-hmm. And there was a power outage once. I had a whole bunch of food, but I'm just like, ooh, I'm going to use one of my survival meals and play the powers out forever, even though it came on like within five minutes. But, um, you know, not really storing what I would really eat. I'd walk around the food store and be like, ah, someone told me about beans. I need to get those beans. And they sat around until I moved out of that place that I was living in at the time. Years later, I'm like, I'm never eating these beans. I don't like these beans, but it's good survival food. So I moved the beans to my next place and they sat around there until I moved again. And I'm like, I am never, ever, ever eating these beans. Why do I have these beans? And so I just realized that, you know, this is kind of part of that store where you eat, eat what you store thing. That I'm always saying that, you know, someone eventually told me. And then also I'd have to say, hmm. Oh, but before I move on from that, um, adding on to the whole network thing. Um, kind of like, uh, I, you know, I really didn't know a lot about communications. I knew a lot about electronics, um, electrical and stuff like that. The lighting sound aspects, special effects, uh, magic illusion, stuff like that. But I really didn't quite um, know communication when it came to radios, two-way radios, ham, CB, and all that. And as important as I think, uh, as it really is, um, I really didn't have a basic knowledge of that. And so I was always really dependent on someone uh, that I knew that was versed in it, or at least somewhat knowledgeable of it. So I, you know, but again, I also never wanted to admit that I had any weak points so um, I guess maybe personal assessment comes with that, making sure that you build up your network, talking to other people um, so that your network's not limited really helps. And of course, along with talking to other people, if, like I said, is um, helping uh, steer you in the right direction uh, to buy gear. I mean, nowadays, like I said, you can go to the web, go to the web, there's a list, this is everything you need. You know, I mean, you can go to the zombieoutpoststore.com website uh, go to the bug out, get home bag checklist, and you'll see everything. But you really want to narrow that down because you're not going to really carry everything. You can't. You can't carry everything on that list. And it's kind of like skills. You know, it, it, the gear you get is going to depend on your skills. So whereas, yeah, maybe in Boy Scouts, I needed all this stuff at the time because I was learning. But I didn't really need as much anymore because my skills were better and your skills are going to dictate the type and amount of gear that you really need 
So that kind of really, um, I guess, would bring me to maybe overlooking my skills at the very beginning, I think was a mistake that I may have made. Uh, because if I went back and I assessed the skills that I have and really knew what I was good at and capable of and knew what I was not good at or had no knowledge about doing, of course, I'd have to know what it is, maybe not necessarily how to do it, but I would um, have maybe learned a lot of that earlier on instead of really trying to figure a lot of it out later. I don't know if that makes sense. So overlooking your skills, especially things that were useful. Um, and for example, during uh, COVID, everything was shut down. There were certain things that I'm like, oh, I've seen people make stuff like this, or I've seen people just build something like that, you know, and it's so easy, you know, I know, you know, you know, people that can do it, but they, they don't, um, when you go to do it, you just don't have the skills to do it, or you're really trying to watch a lot of videos and read up on it to figure out exactly how to do it, and the end product is not as good as what you were expecting because you kind of ignored learning some of those skills. For example, I wanted to uh, do like a shelving thing in this one closet and that was, eh, it came out okay. Um, but uh, leather working, I've been trying to get a scabber made for my one sword and I wanted a really nice leather scabber made. And so it wasn't until months later when I'm finally, you know, I'm able to talk to the right person and really kind of tell me a little bit about it and stuff like that. and. You know, in exchange for his information, I, you know, helped him out with something. So that's the barter part right right there. We're talking about bartering. But then, uh, you know, it was also kind of one of those things that, you know, I finally sat down to do it, and I figured out what I need in the tools. And it's kind of like, you know, I wanted to own my own tools to be able to do it. A couple other projects I think I wanted to do. So that was something that I... Uh, you know, started diving into, and I'm, I'm, I'm all right at it, it's not great, but, um, but yeah, that's the, uh, just of some of the mistakes, or I wish I knew that before, um, another mistake, I guess one of the biggest mistakes I made was, um, I always kind of talk about this one, uh, when it comes to the bug out and get home bag episode, is buying the bag before the gear, because now I had this backpack, and re-going, going back, and reconfiguring and figuring out what I really wanted and needed and stuff like that turned into a um, kind of like a uh, you know I really need a different bag I, I really didn't need this big of a bag on the frame and all this it's like I wanted something a little different it was a little smaller so again assessing your skills the gear that you really need and the um, you know then then the equipment then you buy the bag. Uh, that was one of my mistakes, along with not storing what I would eat and eating what I would store when it came to food storage. I think the, the, those m must have been my two big mistakes um, when it when it comes to uh, the actual mistakes. But overall, everything was kind of like one of those, I wish I knew that when I started. That's my, I guess, the, uh, the uh, prepping mistake of the week in that segment right there, or my mistakes. Uh, let me hear what you have. Chime it in the chat room. Our chat room's open. Just go to Spreaker.com. And we are coming up to the top of the hour break. I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. You're listening to Are You Ready? This week I'm answering your questions. Chime in in the chat room if you have any. And I have more coming up after this brief timeout. I'll be right back. Find Are You Ready on Facebook and Instagram at Are You Ready Radio. You can also visit our home on the web. Just go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the program's link. If you missed the live show, you can listen to the show's archives on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, and many more, including our home on Spreaker. When a disaster happens, are you ready? Do you have the supplies you need to keep you and your family safe and survive? The Zombie Outpost Store in Wilmington, Ohio 
At Caesar Creek Flea Market, stocks quality gear you need to be ready for the next emergency or even a camping trip. Visit zombieoutpoststore.com for location and hours. Check out our assortment of essentials you need when the next disaster happens. Go to zombieoutpoststore.com. Get 10% off a checkout when you mention Are You Ready Radio. Be ready and be prepared. In this digital society, making connections is quickly becoming a lost art form. Yet, if you are a small business owner, building your network is the only way you can get ahead. Can these skills be learned? You bet they can. Read Nose to Nose Networking, no-nonsense in-person networking tips from a master. Who's the master? Well, who better to teach networking and friend-building skills than a golden retriever? The author, Melanie Hope, takes the antics of Abigail and translates them into the human experience. Through Abby, you will learn how to set your intention, build a network, and get into and out of conversations with Grace. If you love the Dog Abby segments on Counterculture Wise Radio, you will love Nose to Nose Networking even more. Find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble in hard copy, Kindle, and Nook. Visit counterculturewise.com for direct links. Hey, how you doing? This is Magic Pierce inviting you and yours to listen to some good friends of mine that have a show too. Did you really think my daddy is the only one that just runs his mouth all the time and that's the only thing I listen to? (laughs) No, it's not. I got a show I listen to on Sundays. Join host Max and his co-host, uh, my hottie Fritzy, and of course my good friend Abby on Counterculture Wise Sundays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern. They have their own human guests, Melanie and Jim, each week. They don't meow a lot, but you get what they're saying. Now let me tell you, you have to go to counterculturewise.com. Use your pause to play with the mouse and scroll down to the on the air button on the right to hear their show. Just click on that. After that, watch them on Periscope like I do. Daddy gives me a little mouse to play with, and I get parts the whole time. It's a great show. Check it out. Counterculturewise.com. If you don't tune in, I get cuckoos on you. Thank you so much for that ringing endorsement magic. It warms the orange hearts of me and Abby and the gray heart of Fritzy to hear you say such amazing things about our show. I'm pretty sure that Mumsy and Father have pink hearts, so we will assume their hearts are warmed too. Ah, forget about it. I got you guys. Good peoples. Got a spare tire around that waist? Is your muffin top over the top? Do you binge eat uncontrollably? We are the government and we are here to help you. Here at our free FEMA weight loss camp, we have numerous ways to help you shed those unsightly, unwanted pounds. FEMA, or Fatties, eating mitigated, automatically has a communist-style weight loss czar that specializes in centralized weight loss planning and communal extended fasting programs to shed that fat away in no time. Skin and boned means extra tone is the motto. Just remember, there is no way you can do it on your own. We will forcefully assist you into compliance. Failure is not an option in this utopian wonderland. How fantastic. Typical workout regimes include digging ditches and restocking them with dirt. Building railways and more. Get life skills while you get lean. How do you join? Simple. Recite the Constitution in a public commons or violate the Patriot Act that includes simple misdemeanors. It's really that easy to get your own fenced-in slice of Americana. Stop being a fatty. The state is your daddy. If you like what you are listening to, we appreciate your support. A small contribution from you, the listeners, can continue to help bring you such content and help keep things going here. Even if it's just a dollar a month. 
keep in mind though, in the spirit of prepping, we believe in redundancy, so it's better to have more than one, but every little bit helps pay the bills. Go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the support the show link. You can make a one-time or monthly contribution in any dollar amount. And again, thank you for your support and listening. You are listening to Are You Ready Radio with Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. And we are back. You're listening to Are You Ready Radio. I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. This wonderful Wednesday evening with you. Just rounded our first hour, and this week I am answering questions. This is a little Q&A uh, episode. I'm going to do one of these every once in a while, so send your questions in. I like answering them. Before the break, I discussed the, um, what is it, uh, important items, uh, barter items. Also, uh, mistakes that I've made, things I wish I knew back when. In the very top of the episode, we addressed um, how to um, respond, react, and what to do during a um, mass shooting event or a mass attack and the different types. So make sure you tune into the beginning of the broadcast if you missed that. Go back. Uh, it's been uh, quite a topic lately ever since the uh, most recent events in Buffalo this week. Um, and so I'm just getting back to our questions here. Make sure you check them out. Uh, you can check out all of our archived episodes just going to um, Are You Ready Radio on Facebook or Instagram. You'll see a link to our shows there. You should. Um, if not, you can go to the zombieoutpoststore.com because this is the official broadcast of the Zombie Outpost in Wilmington, Ohio at Caesar Creek Flea Market. And uh, moving on with your questions. Um, coming up, I have Are You Still uh, Going to Be Barefoot When the Fit Hits the Shan? Books that I recommend, uh, the most important pieces of gear, styles of martial arts, and... Uh, of course, a debate about trapping, fishing, hunting, foraging, gathering, gardening, and all that. So, getting back to it, uh, let me go to this is a, this is a good question here. Uh, most Im- no, most important barter items did that books. Yes, okay, here we go. I'm in the right place. Uh, what books videos do you recommend for someone getting started? Wow, I've read a lot of books. I have done a lot of research on websites. I have talked to a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of manufacturers, and I've read a lot of books, and a lot of books, and a lot more books. I had a pretty decent library at one point that I downsized. Uh, most important books. I'm going to give you my top three, maybe four. I think there's probably four in this one. I would definitely recommend a book called Where There Is No Doctor. It's a village uh, healthcare handbook, I think it's called, Where There Is No Doctor. Uh, Let's see, it's written by David Warner, I believe. Don't hold me to that. I'm going to have to maybe do a little uh, looking up here, just if I make a mistake. Yeah, um, let me see here. Where There Is No Doctor. Yeah, village healthcare handbook. Uh, based on David Werner's experience at his projects in Western New Mexico, uh, this is uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, yeah health health guide healthcare manual. What I like about this book, and this is why it's one of my recommendations, is there are no particular order. This is not my top three, top four list, uh, starting with number four. Uh, these are no particular order at all. The uh, the book outlines pretty much everything from uh, sanitation, minor health care, to major health issues. Uh, the newer edition even deals with um, a lot of different, um, oh, what was it, AIDS is in there now, HIV. Um, I'd have to go back through and see exactly what was added. It's a big book. It is a huge book. Now, I recommend, though, I think it's like a 1,000, maybe 2,000 pages. It's up there. Uh, very thorough, though. Uh, so where you don't have access to hospitals, uh, this is very off-grid and very thorough, very handy. So 
uh, I would definitely recommend, of course, you may give it a good read, read through it, but always have it handy as reference because there's so much in there that you're going to miss reading it and you're, you're going to need it as a reference. Uh, th th it's very detailed and very thorough. It pretty much addresses almost everything. Now, um, I have um, I, I have all these in a PDF format. You can download the book, from what I understand, in sections, but I do have the full PDF. And um, if you have, and I probably discussed this in previous episodes, when it comes to books in your library, in your prepper library, I know I did it in the, um, the original relaunch series with my co-host, Sophie Prince. We discussed our prepper library, and I also have, I believe, a YouTube video about it. If it's still out there, it may be. And if you um, check out that episode, um, I believe it's called The Prepper Library, if it's still available to listen to um, from the previous relaunch uh, years ago. Now, that um, I keep a tablet, and I also have a, an old cell phone that... I have all these loaded onto my, my, my whole library, really. And when I downsized my library, I just got rid of the hard copy books. Uh, this is one book I never got rid of. And, and my top four will never, um, I'm purposely, be gotten rid of. Because there, there's so much, sometimes you just want to open up a page where you know it is, or in that area, thumb through it, and it's one of those books. Another one similar to that one um, that you would always have on hand that I would never get rid of the hard copy even though I have multiple copies uh, in the digital version is the SAS Survival Handbook. It's a survival guide uh, by a British officer. He was a soldier, a professional soldier, John Weissman. And it was originally published in the mid-80s. The second edition came out somewhere in... The early 2000s. Well, we're only 22 years into the 2000s. I believe it was somewhere around 2008, 2010, somewhere around there. Uh, you can also has a digital app for smartphones, which is also based on the book, and, and, this, and the app is also available. It has uh, quite a few sections, and it really d details how to survive in dangerous uh, circumstances and situations, surroundings, and all that. Uh, it's the SAS Survival Handbook by uh, John Weissman. Hmm. The next book that I have, and yeah, I, that, that was, I don't know, I'm always back and forth between these two. But, okay, so it's, it's going to be four books. Peterson's Edible Wild Plants. Now... It's it's a field guide by Roger Peterson or Roger Troy or Roger Roger Peterson. I, if I turn around, it's on my shelf, but it's it's small enough. I know exactly where it is, but I don't want to face away from the mic and fumble around looking for it. The um, the author uh, Peterson, which is why it's called Peterson's Edible Wild Plants or Peterson's Field Guide to Edible Wild Plants is another name. Uh, it's also referred to as. Um, the one that I have is um, specific to Peterson's it's Peterson's Edible Wild Plants, Eastern Central North America. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on where you live. Uh, he's written many field guides, mostly about birds, which I find out. But this, in my opinion, is probably the most valuable to preppers and survivalists in North America, aside from your medical book where there is no doctor and your survival handbook which is the SAS survival manual or handbook now um, just the way he has identified broken down the identification system it's a whole system of identification for plants so the whole book is full of all these edible um, plants all over um, eastern central North America so you'll be amazed at trees that you may have growing in your own yard that they're edible. And he also breaks down the different uses for them. So throughout the book in different sections, um, it'll say, like, okay, these are for, we'll say, making grains from. These are for this. These are for um, uh, tons of numbers of things. Um, so he he really breaks it down, not just in their uses, but also... Um, the way to identify him 
And it, it turns out um, he really is the one that kind of started, um, he created this classification system, or ident- not classification, identification system for uh, plants that's become very popular and widely taught. So I definitely recommend that one. And it's nice. It's it's a small pocket size, it, not pocket pocket size, but I guess a larger pocket size book. And um, yeah, it, it's it's great. Now, the next one I would have to say would be, and this is why there's four, because it's always hard to, to to narrow the hundreds down. Is earth medicine, earth food, um, plant remedies, drugs, and natural foods of the North American Indians. What was interesting is I've had this book for years, and uh, quite a while, and it was written, it, it is, not was, it, it is, it's written by Michael A. Weiner. Now, Michael Allen Weiner uh, is also known by his professional name of Michael Savage, and uh, for those of you who listen to talk radio, I don't know if you've heard that name, he was actually an American uh, conservative uh conspiracy theorist, political commentator, activist, and he, he he's a former talk radio host. Now, fast forward maybe 10, 12, 20, eh, about 10 years, uh, maybe about, yeah, about 5 to 10 years, somewhere after I bought the book, and it was part of my collection, and one of my go-tos that I would say, okay, these are the most important ones of what I have so far, made my top picks. Many years ago, all of a sudden there's this radio show on on the station that I listen to with other uh, talk radio hosts, and he's on there later at night around 9 o'clock, and I'm like, ooh, that's pretty cool, I like this guy. Well, he started talking about the book, Earth Medicine, that he wrote. So I look at the cover, I'm like, it doesn't say Michael Savage. It turns out that Michael Savage is his professional name that he uses, but Michael Allen Weiner is his real name. It turns out he's really a Ph.D., uh, from he was originally born and raised and all that in, in New York because I remember before I even connected the two when he started talking about Earth Medicine and Earth Food he, had a, he would read sometimes a chapter an excerpt from his book Psychological Nudity which I ended up getting and I liked it and stories Tippy the Dog is a funny one if you ever picked that book up I, I'm not endorsed by any of these authors or any of these publishers or anything like that this is just my pick and he, he also wrote another great book nothing to do with prepping or anything it was about his stories him and his dad and his dog and all this. So, yeah, he was really a, a, a he, had, he has a PhD and he specialized in nutritional ethnomedicine. Now, ethnomedicine is a study uh, or the comparison of, I guess, traditional medicines based on the compounds in the plant, like the biological active, bi- bioactive, there it is, bioactive compounds in plants and animals and it's typically practiced by indigenous people especially those with less access to western medicine so it's also known as ethnomedicine is also referred to as traditional medicine so that kind of fits in not just with our edible wild guide to plants but also with our where there is no doctor category so you pretty much have a broad range covered there with those four books those are my four recommendations so um, make sure you check those out. And let's see. Another question someone asked is... Oh, this would be perfect for our Prepping Kitchen Tip of the Week. So, uh, here's the question. There it is. Okay. The most important thing. Oh, what is the most important thing in your prepper kitchen? Oh, okay. Well, um, among all the devices, there's there's tons of them out there. I, I think we probably did a list on the prepper kitchen at one point. Um, but uh, th- there's so many things that, that, that you, you again, you can do tons of research, you can do tons, read tons of articles, uh, read 100 books, and um, every everything you see will always say, uh, hand, crank, coffee, grinder. Mm. I don't drink coffee. 
I don't think it's the most important thing. Now, it could be used to grind up a lot of things. I mean, if it can grind coffee beans, maybe you can make uh, flour out of it. But Oh, the French press coffee maker. Uh, that's a very popular one on the list because when there's no power and all this cast iron cookware to cook in, it's good. Now, that's actually a, a tip that I used a couple weeks ago, of course. Can openers, not electric ones, but manual ones. Uh, like those little P51, P38 ones are great. Hand crank ones, of course. A whole set of butchering tools, knife sharpening sets, honing oil, all kinds of stuff, canning equipment. You know, when you look at some of these lists and everything, they go on and on and on forever. The hand grain mill. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, the manual meat grinder. Yep, yeah, because everybody needs to chop meat. I mean, hey, in a survival situation, just be glad you have meat. Uh, let's see, hand crank sifters. Go to the toy store and get one of those uh, little sand sifters that come with all the other toys. You'll have more fun using it for other things, too. I mean, you could build a whole flower castle or dirt castle, a mud castle, a zombie castle. Get the whole set of sand toys, the moles and everything. Uh, stainless steel everything. Yeah, mortar and pestle. pestle. Uh, you know, okay, a lot of these are great. Matches, out the wazoo. A wind-up kitchen timer. <laughs> uh, stainless steel tea kettle. Big Berkey filter. Food dehydrator. You know, food dehydrator is a good one. I don't know. Anyway, paper plates, napkins, knives. Yeah, the food dehydrator. Okay. Hmm. I would have to say, if you go through a majority of all these lists that are out there online... Uh, I don't know if I'd even need the food dehydrator. Mm. Here's why. Okay. Tons of gadgets out there that preppers should have in their kitchens. Now, my thing is not so much the what you the gear that you need to have, but your know-how. Do you know how to preserve food? Do you know how to prepare food and all that? Based on different cooking methods that you may be uh, confronted with in order to prepare the food, store the food. Now, th there's many different things. That's why I like the dehydrator. That's always the hard thing. Okay. Okay. The food dehydrator, I think, would definitely be an item on the list that I would want in mind, providing you have power to run it. Um... Really, method, know-how, and all that are going to be the most important in your prepper kitchen when the fit hits the shan or during any even light emergency because, you know, I always talk about alternate cooking methods. So I guess, yeah, the alternate cooking method would be a good thing, but that's not necessarily the most important thing in your prepper kitchen because any, a lot of people, almost anybody can make a fire, but do you know how to cook on a fire? I would say among all the devices... Grinders to food dehydrators, I would have to say the most important would have to be a good cookbook that inspires you and teaches you not just how to cook in a kitchen, but also on an open fire using various cooking methods, different ways of, uh, of using fire, how to make the fire, and all that. I would have to say that that is pretty much the... Oh! Oh, shameless plug here! <laughs> I wasn't planning on this part of the answer. But I am working on a cookbook. Yes, mm -hmm. the camping cookbook, the Barefoot Preppers Camping Cookbook. Now, it's I always say it's beyond hamburgers and hot dogs. Enough of that. No hamburgers, no hot dogs. And no ramen noodles either at camp. The cookbook that I'm working on, the recipes are done. I'm working on the photography now, so every time I go out, in the woods and I go camping or make one of the meals on in the field. I'm not I'm not doing this in the studio. I'm not I'm not no no no. What it looks like when it comes off a fire or out of a Dutch oven is exactly what's in that picture. So uh yeah, those are the pictures that I'm working on. So I'm I'm each each time I go out I'm doing one recipe and throughout the year camping and all that I'll I'll have a whole cookbook full of these recipes uh photographed ready to go. And it goes into publication. So uh, the cookbook I'm working on is the Barefoot Preppers uh, Camping Cookbook. So in the, in the cookbook, each recipe, I mean, first of all, these are great recipes. 
they also have different tips for doing ahead, going camping, easy prep, um, storage, all your tips and tricks about camping, keeping your food safe and you safe, um, keeping your food from getting eaten by other animals that are out there to get your food, as well as the different cooking methods to prepare it. From an open fire to like foil cooking, like foil pouch cooking, and even Dutch oven. So a lot of the recipes um, are pretty, pretty, they're good recipes. Uh, they're not shabby at all. But eating well and uh, knowing how to cook uh, through different cooking methods, I would have to say would be uh, very useful in your prepper kitchen. And of course, have alternate cooking methods, like I've said in the past. And yes, the gadgets and all that are great. And I think that maybe along the next few episodes, I'll throw, you know, maybe a prepper kitchen tip as far as some of these gadgets and, and maybe uh, highlight why they are um, great and, and probably the next best thing since sliced bread in your, in your prepper kitchen. Because even though the lists, there's so many lists, even though there's so many lists and the gadgets go on and on and on forever, um, the know-how, knowledge, skill, and effectiveness and ease of doing it is important and you just need to really know what you're doing once you know what you're doing and you've made a few fires a few times you know which ones work best for what you're looking to do um, the ones if you need coals faster the ones if you need high heat you know the ones that, that'll work you know on your cookware um, you know is it too hot for aluminum foil is it you know hot enough to cook what you need how to use a Dutch oven to bake and to um, roast and stuff like that. Uh, th those are the most important when it comes to, um, you know, being effective in your post-apocalyptic kitchen. Because you want to be able to cook and serve good meals, you know, while fighting zombies. And, and a good cookbook uh, that tells you how to do that along with the recipes and gives you the knowledge and the how-to and all that is probably the most beneficial and that would be I guess my most important thing to have in your prepper kitchen. So that is the prepping kitchen tip of the week. Now this brings me to the next question here. Um, kind of has to do with the kitchen. If I remember right, uh, it has to do with food storage. Let me just see if we can find that one real quick because it kind of ties into this. Uh, where to go? Uh, there we go. What mistakes should I avoid when buying survival food? Uh, in the program in the past, I've mentioned this a number of different times um, as far as the food that you buy that you're going to stockpile. Now, I always say that you want to, first of all, store what you eat, 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 store what you eat, eat what you store. So I would have to say based on that theory, I can't say there's any one particular rule to follow or the biggest mistake really or what to one big mistake to avoid. But don't buy food that you don't like. Now, earlier in the program, remember I mentioned when it came to, you know, things I wish I knew back then or, you know, and I talked about certain things that I had that I thought would make great survival food. Those, the bag of beans, well, um, I'm not a big fan of beans. So it really got sat around, pushed around and all that until I just got so old. Um, so buying food that you don't like, that you've never eaten before, um, it, it, it's it's a waste, and you're not going to use it. It's not going to be beneficial. To, I mean, it will be beneficial to you if you eventually eat it and have to eat it. But you want to pretty much uh, buy the stuff that you're going to use. So uh, don't think that, oh, don't, don't ever open that. That's our prepping survival food. We don't eat that. Well, you're going to have to eat it. You should. Uh, maybe... Mm, oh, in a previous episode, I mentioned probably a kitchen tip. I know it came up. Uh making sure that the food that you store is easy is easy to make and also um, a lot of times you think that oh, I'll just buy this in bulk and you buy a huge package of food and you put that in your emergency food storage and then when you need it in a situation you're you don't have any way to once you open this big, we'll say, number 10 can of, uh, we'll say, applesauce. You don't have any way, if the power's down or anything like that, to preserve it. So it really just goes to waste. 
So extra large packages and hard to make foods that you're not able to just heat up or make in the limited resources that you may have is a big problem when it comes to emergency or survival food. Same thing with, um, I would have to say maybe the nutrition comes into it. You want to make sure that you're buying foods that have the nutrition that you need. And uh, that kind of goes along with like, you know, looking at your dietary needs sometimes, you know, you'll, you may be sitting there um, like, wow, all this canned chicken is great. It's great survival food. And a year later, the whole family turns vegan, and you're like, I'm never going to eat this, and it's still sitting there. I mean, it has a very long shelf life, but uh, yeah. Uh, mistakes food storage-wise, I would also have to say uh, cardboard boxes. Cardboard boxes are a problem. They attract moisture, so anything in them will soak up any kind of humidity. There's also no protection from any kind of elements if the elements get into your food, such as like if there's a storm, a flood, or anything like that. Uh, same thing with uh, they don't protect it against like rodents and bugs. So if you do buy food in cardboard boxes, you want to somehow seal them in either another plastic bag. Like if I, I always vacuum packs like spaghettis and pastas and stuff like that for long-term storage. And um, I also try to keep a lot of stuff that may be in bag, like flour, sugars, uh, salts, anything in cardboard or paper, um, even boxes of pasta and stuff that I'm going to use um, right away. I still keep those in like Tupperware or some type of bin, storage bin, uh, or case or tote or um, you know anything that rodents can't chew through easily to get to them and ruin the food. And any sign of any kind of rodent or anything that may have gnawed at a box or any droppings around it, well, you got to throw all that stuff out um, if it's not protected and they do get to it. Because even if they maybe just chewed through the box, there could be something else wrong with it at that point, even though it doesn't look like they've eaten anything and you see no droppings in the food. So I would have to say in food storage, you want to keep an eye on that. Um, those, those are the ones that I can think of, the big ones. And I'm sure there's others that escape my mind. Uh, coming up to the last break of this episode, and then we have more coming to you after this brief timeout. I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. This is our Q&A episode of Are You Ready? Emergency Preparedness and Survival. Stick around. We will be right back. Find Are You Ready on Facebook and Instagram at Are You Ready Radio. You can also visit our home on the web. Just go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the program's link. If you missed the live show, you can listen to the show's archives on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, and many more, including our home on Spreaker. When a disaster happens, are you ready? Do you have the supplies you need to keep you and your family safe and survive? The Zombie Outpost store in Wilmington, Ohio at Caesar Creek Flea Market stocks quality gear you need to be ready for the next emergency or even a camping trip. Visit zombieoutpoststore.com for location and hours. Check out our assortment of essentials you need when the next disaster happens. Go to zombieoutpoststore.com. Get 10% off at checkout when you mention Are You Ready Radio. Be ready and be prepared. In this digital society, making connections is quickly becoming a lost art form. Yet, if you are a small business owner, building your network is the only way you can get ahead. Can these skills be learned? You bet they can. Read Nose to Nose Networking, no-nonsense in-person networking tips from a master. Who's the master? Well, who better to teach networking and friend-building skills than a golden retriever? The author, Melanie Hope, takes the antics of Abigail and translates them into the human experience. Through Abby, you will learn how to set your intention, build a network, and get into and out of conversations with Grace. If you love the Dog Abby segments on CounterCultureWise Radio, you will love Nose to Nose Networking even more. Find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble in hard copy, Kindle, and Nook. Visit counterculturewise.com for direct links. Greetings. 
Greetings and salutations, counterculture-wise listeners. This is Maximilian von Riegelbeezer inviting you and yours to listen to me and mine. Join me, my sisters Abby and Fritzy, and my weekly guests, my father Jim and Mumsy Melanie, for counterculture-wise. Max, it's not your show. And we're not your guests, Max. We're the hosts. You may want to rein it in a little bit, buddy. Very well. Tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. Pacific at counterculturewise.com for our amazing live variety show. You can even chat with us. If you ask me, though, it should be called Counterculture Max. Counterculture Wise. Radio with heart in mind. If you like what you are listening to, we appreciate your support. A small contribution from you, the listeners, can continue to help bring you such content and help keep things going here, even if it's just a dollar a month. Keep in mind, though, in the spirit of prepping, we believe in redundancy, so it's better to have more than one, but every little bit helps pay the bills. Go to nickpiercemedia.com and click on the Support the Show link. You can make a one-time or monthly contribution in any dollar amount. And again, thank you for your support and listening. You are listening to Are You Ready Radio with Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. And welcome back to Are You Ready? Emergency Preparedness and Survival Radio with me, Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper, and answering your Q&As this week. Coming down to the last half hour, I still have enough time to squeeze a few of these in and hope we don't run out of time. I want to get to all these, so I'm going to hurry up and move on with them. Uh, This is a great question. Um, what is the most important piece of gear that you have? How long have you had it? And where can I get it? Everybody wants all the cool stuff. Yeah, well, it's not really a piece of gear that you can buy or that you can go out and get. It's something you have to develop on your own. I'm going to say the brain, your mind. That is the most important anything you have is your mind, your brain, and what you know because you can think through anything you can plan through anything and that's the most important part and it's just a matter of developing your brain with some of the basic fundamental um training the the, the thinking of and and you need to have the mentality of of a prepper survivalist the will to live and uh, the ability to improv um the ability to um, a number of different things and a number of skills and it doesn't matter what piece of equipment you have um, it's only as good as if you know how to use it and so the most important item I would have to say the short answer would be your brain your mind now here's another very interesting question um, that's always kind of come up in some conversation at some point and it all depends on who starts the conversation And who has done what? And this question is, what style of martial arts do you prefer or what is the most effective? Here we go. Uh, You know, it's personal preference. It's what form of martial arts are you able to do and that you're the most effective in is really the question. Because it's not up to what form of martial arts is more effective, it's how effective you are using it. So the style really doesn't matter. Um, Of course, uh, there's some, you know, martial arts out there that I can't even say martial arts, they're more like dancing, but it's, it's more for show and it's more of an art form than it is developed for the purposes of actual self-defense, combat fighting, or anything like that. So, find a style of martial arts that's geared towards, we'll say, self-defense. And you want a style of martial arts that you're physically capable of doing. Uh, You want a style of martial arts that's going to teach you techniques that you're easily able to deploy when needed. And I had an interesting conversation with someone um, at the Zombie Outpost the other day. And we're talking about a certain disarming things. And 
uh, tactics and techniques. And he was saying, you know, the Israeli disarming thing, it's really made to, you know, be aware of, like, people beyond, you know, your threat and other people that may be involved around you and all that. And they had this very effective move. And really the way to execute is by learning some of the basics in that form of the Israeli martial arts that they've trained and learned for a long time and are very proficient in before they can actually execute this move. Whereas other moves that both of us knew were um, based on his style of fighting and my style of training. And so it was kind of one of those things where neither one of them is most effective and which one would I prefer? I prefer something that's extremely useful and highly effective. What's the most effective? Well, anything that you can actually do. Neither one of us, we, we, I've, seen the, I've seen the technique, and he's seen the technique, and he's tried to do it, and he's very good at what he does, and so am I when it comes to my style of martial arts. But when it comes to this one technique, I guess we're not going to do that. Even if we do learn that, we're not trained. We haven't trained doing that. And we're always going to revert back to something we're more comfortable with, which would be based on our own styles and our own disciplines of what we studied. That that, <laughs> that was that. Because it's so true. I could learn a new technique based on another form of martial arts, and when it really comes down to when I really have to use it, you can't have any hesitation or question. You need to be able to fluently, accurately and effectively use it. So if there's any doubt, it's not for you. Therefore, it would not be effective. So I would probably always, probably whether I learned how to do that move really well or not, I think when it really depended on it, I would still revert back to something that my training that I'm familiar with, that I'm fluid in, uh, I would use a maneuver based on that, not something that I've never actually used in real life that I just learned. When I need to use it in real life, I'm going to revert back to something I'm much better at and more comfortable doing. So as far as what style I prefer, what's the most effective, it doesn't matter. It's not my choice, it's your choice, and it's whatever you're able to execute effectively after you've trained. And next question. Uh, this is an interesting one. Do you prefer trapping, fishing, hunting, foraging, or gathering? Trapping, fishing, hunting, foraging, or gathering? A gardening. I'm sorry, I misread that. Or gardening. Like foraging, gathering. Well, it's kind of the same thing. Um, well, gardening. Okay. Uh, my answer, neither. Honestly. Neither would be my forte. Of course. Oh, you're going to starve during the apocalypse. No, I'm not. I'm good. Neither would be my cup of tea. Now, it's important to be knowledgeable and have a degree of skill in each. But again, I always say this, we cannot be good at everything. Deep sea fishing I'm good at. I can fish in salt water. Fine. Know what I'm doing? I catch it. Inland lake, stream, river, not at all. Haven't caught, I caught one fish my entire time freshwater fishing in Ohio. Put me on the beach, I know what I'm doing. I can find I can harvest. I can, you'll, you'll be amazed what I can find on a beach. And uh, even in the water in the bay, even from a small boat, I know what I'm doing. I can find clams. I can, I can find lobster. I can, crabs. I'm, I'm good. I have no problem. Salt water. Fresh water? Hmm. Not so much. I have bad luck. The fish do not like me. I am not allowed near the water when any of my friends or family are fishing. So I'm not going to catch anything and I scare them away. My job is to leave that area alone. Uh, Let's think. Trapping. Okay? I know about it. And I've practiced setting traps, so I know how they work. I make sure that they will work. Uh, Have I set them up to really use, not for an extended period of time, and not with the real purposes of really catching anything? So, I haven't had to at a necessity. But I have learned, I have, you know, I can make certain snares and certain, you know, things to to do it if I have to. Am I as good as people that trap all the time? No, not at all. Same thing with hunting. Yes, I have the equipment and knowledge, um, but I have not been successful bagging a deer, wild boar, or sasquatch yet. So it's 
not my thing. If I really have to, I can. Um, foraging. I can ID and collect about maybe 10% of what I have in my environment. Now that's without the book, without Peterson's, without the guidebook, field guide, anything like that. But I do need confirmation beyond that. So I'm, I'm reliant on anything above that 10% that's around all the time or that I'm familiar with, that I'm, I know how to use, that I know it, all its phases and all that. So I went out and I studied it through all different seasons. And so about 10% of what's in my environment, I'm that familiar with where I can just look at it, pick it, know it, eat it, prep it, whatever I have to do. Outside of that, I'm using the, the Peterson's Field Guide or the uh, Edible Wild Plants book. As far as gardening, I don't know if you've heard the story about the pepper plant. My neighbor, I started dabbling in gardening years ago, and I wasn't doing that well, but there was a plant that was growing really well, and as far as I know, he, he's a green thumb. There's a lot of landscaping. He did property man. He, he knows his stuff. He's, he's he knows his gardening. He knows his plants. He knows his landscaping and all that. And so uh, we were cooking out one night, and I said, "Hey Dan," I said, "Is this one of those pepper plants I planted?" He goes, "You bet it is." And I took care of that thing because it was really one of the only real healthy plants growing that well. It was great, and I would water this thing, and I took care of it. And I was waiting for peppers and waiting for peppers and waiting for peppers. And then August rolls around. He goes, oh, they'll be coming up by the end of the month. September rolls around. Eh, it's still too early because of the weather. I just took his word for it. Plants starting not to look too good. we have starting to get a little cold nights. And, you know, I take care of it and cover it and nurse this thing. And I wanted peppers and I'm waiting for peppers. And there were never any peppers. Finally, the winter came and it died off, and I was very upset. I was distraught. My pepper plant, it didn't make it, but I'm going to try again next year. He had me going all summer. That was not a pepper plant. It was nothing but a weed. Very sad. I was very disappointed. I will still, I'm still plotting my revenge to this day on that one. And I will get him good. Oh, I will get him good. It's going to take a while. It's going to happen when he's least expecting it. He's also older, so i got to hurry up and do this as well. But I'm going to get back at him for that pepper plant. I have planted gardens, though, successfully in the past. And uh, I do okay with that. It's not bad. I I'm getting better. So you think, really? I'm really going to starve to death based on all that. If I can't forage i can't trap i'm terrible at fishing in fresh water uh foraging i'm 10 percent on the mark there and gardening i was taking care of a weed and not a, anything that had any value at all to the human existence when it came to food um, herbal remedies medicine herbs spices nothing what kind of a prepper survivalist am i well I have built my network. Uh, my network. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have friends. I have family and neighbors that are very good at all that stuff. I offer skills and equipment, many other things that they do not have, and things that they need. Among them is preparing what has been caught. I can field strip, dispatch, butcher, fillet, process, preserve, can smoke, dehydrate, and most importantly, cook very well even in a primitive kitchen if you can grow it i can if you if you can catch it if you can take it down i will do the rest and we will all eat very well and it's interesting cuz like you know everything you could you could you could you could do everything to a fish you need to do depending on what kind of fish it is you got it down you know exactly where to cut the method this that, and the other and yeah I don't catch many fish anymore in fresh water now that I live in Ohio. So, none at all. One in all the years. So, interesting video. Where do you learn to do all the fish and all that? Well, I know a lot about the fish. I've 
I, I used to catch fish. I can fillet a fish. I can do anything to a fish. Um, the only thing I can't do is to a fish is sex a fish and tell you what uh, <laughs> what sex it is, and I and I I can't breed them. But outside of that, give me a fish. I got everything else. And so, uh, you know, I, I told him, I said, there's a cool video on YouTube with this guy from some fish farm or something like that, or fish distributor or something. He he does a video, it's maybe about 10 minutes long, he shows you how to do every fish in the world, almost. Every fish, but almost every type of fish, based on size and, you know, type and all that. And it was like, wow, cool. So everything from, like, squid to octopus to, like, sardines to shark to, it's, you know, probably tunas on there. So... Yeah, I recommended that video for him. We were talking about it. So that's, uh, yeah, that's that. Okay, next one on the list is uh, last two questions here. So I think we have plenty of time now. Um, if you can only have one knife, would it be a fixed blade or a folding knife? Hmm. Good question. See, knives have different purposes. Uh, for example, like a fillet knife, a skinning knife, a survival knife, a hunting knife, a... Uh, a, um, a sailor's knife, pocket knives, uh, folding knives, they all have uh, different purposes and uh, practical for many different uses. Um, however, some knives are very specific to certain things. I would have to say, though, if I can only have one knife, and that was my choice of what I would have, if. I may not even need a knife, but I can make a knife. But if I had to pick between the two, We'll stick with the question, though. We won't overthink this too much. If you could only have one knife, I'd probably go with a fixed blade. I'd want a durable survival knife. Doesn't have to be a huge buoy knife. Doesn't have to be a machete. Doesn't have to be uh, some monster fixed blade uh, knife. I would want it to be a fixed blade for a number of reasons. It would have to be small enough to use close quarter self-defense, um, easy to carry, not too big, easy to maneuver, has decent reach though, but is also very rugged and durable to be able to use for many different purposes. So I would want a knife that I can do. Uh, it would have to be a multitasker. A folding knife is not going to do, in my opinion, anything that would fit my plan. So if I'm, we'll say, more out in the wild, off-grid, maybe having to build shelter, cut through wood, um, you know, use as a weapon, put on the head of a, you know, put on the tip of a stick to use as a spear, maybe do spear fishing, you know, number of things that I know that the blade would be used for. I don't necessarily need a folding knife because it's not going to hold up to what I'm going to put it through. And if I could only have one, I would have to say a fixed blade. A nice, sturdy survival knife would be fine. Uh, the blade doesn't have to be more than eight inches long. Six inches. Well, six inches maybe a little small. I'll go eight inches. Uh, but I wouldn't want anything really much longer than that based on uh, what I would use it for and pretty much anything else I could really kind of think of. So um, I would probably go with a, a, a def well, I'd definitely go with a fixed blade knife somewhere between the we'll say eight to ten inch range, and of course full tang. And of course the final question I have for this episode and the big one that everybody always wants to know. Yes, the barefoot prepper um, has been asked many times. Me, um, are you still going barefoot when the fit hits the shan? Well, yes. I am barefoot 24-7. I've been this way for many, many, many years, decades. And the fit could hit the shan any time. So, yes, I will be barefoot. And uh, I have, um, you know, developed the endurance, the tolerance, and the ability to be able to be barefoot in almost any condition. So, um, of course... Things could change. You never know how bad it's going to get during the apocalypse. But I have found that, yes, my intentions would also be to be barefoot as well, even during the apocalypse or when the fit hits the sham. And the fit has hit the sham many times, uh, you know, and I have been barefoot through it all. So that is my Q&A. I enjoyed answering your questions, and please keep sending them in. 
I had a great time. Well, I hope that I helped you seriously think, prepare, and answer the question, are you ready? I'm Nick Pierce, the Barefoot Prepper. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in and the support you give the show. Our guests, the callers, our friends in chat, uh, listeners, uh, clients, customers, everybody at the store, everything. Find Are You Ready on Facebook and Instagram at Are You Ready Radio. You can also find us on the web at nickpiercemedia.com. Click on the program's link. Find us on your favorite podcast platforms and on our home on Spreaker. To contribute to the show, go to Nick Pierce Media and click on the Support the Show link. Are You Ready Radio is the official podcast of Zombie Outpost in Wilmington, Ohio and is an NP Media Group production. Music.